welcome. I'm Rebecca Pham, Program Manager at Launchpad Western Sydney University. I'm extremely delighted to be your host and MC for the first ever Urban Futures Demo Day. I would like to begin by acknowledging that I'm hosting this event on the country of the Darug people of the Darug Nation. I also acknowledge the traditional custodians of the various lands on which you all work today and the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people participating in this live stream. I pay my respects to Elders past, present and emerging and celebrate the diversity of Aboriginal peoples and their ongoing cultures and connections to the lands and waters of New South Wales. The Urban Futures Program is a property industry technology accelerator delivered by Lancome and Launchpad. The goal of the accelerator is to seed and grow innovation within the property development industry in support of the Lancome and University strategic priorities and aspirations for enhanced urban living in Western Sydney. Before we jump into the pitch event, I'd like to introduce John Brogdon, who's the Chief Executive Officer of Lancome, to welcome you. As CEO of Lancome, I'm delighted that we are collaborating with Western Sydney University's Launchpad in the Urban Futures Accelerator Program. I'd like to welcome and thank the participants. I'm sure this PropTech Accelerator Program will be rewarding and beneficial for everyone. Lancome has a long history of leading innovation in the property sector. This program signifies a bold leap into the technology startup world, which has already energised our thinking and opened up new possibilities. We're optimistic that this demo day is just the beginning. We choose to continue to work with the startup community so we can jointly create more productive, affordable and sustainable communities for the people of New South Wales. I would also like to invite Professor Deborah Sweeney, our Deputy Vice-Chancellor and Vice-President of Research, Enterprise and International at Western Sydney University to say a quick welcome. Welcome. I'm Professor Deborah Sweeney, the Deputy Vice-Chancellor, Research, Enterprise and International at Western Sydney University. Let me also acknowledge the traditional owners of the country on which we are all located today and pay respect to their elders, past and present, and thank them for their support of our work in their lands and beyond. And on behalf of the University, welcome to the Urban Futures PropTech Accelerator Demo Day. We're extremely excited to support this great initiative and to be delivering it in partnership with Lancom. Undertaking activities like this, and importantly in partnership, is we believe key to developing and supporting a thriving prop tech sector in Western Sydney. Let me congratulate all the startups pitching today and thank you for your efforts over the last three months. I hope you have gained tremendously from the program and see real opportunities to support your further growth particularly during these challenging times. We've been pleased to have not only our researchers, but also our students working with Launchpad to support the program. And we look forward to the further opportunities for collaboration with our many research capabilities across the university as your, as your businesses continue to mature. Over the last three months, we've been working closely with 10 selected startups, solving some of the biggest property challenges around community education, engagement and insights, livability, sustainability, markets and finance, and compliance and regulation management. Through the Urban Futures Accelerator, we've helped the startups gain access to a range of Lancome's industry specialists and partners, Launchpad's mentors and commercialization experts to support them in their journey. Very soon, the startups will pitch their business to you and our panel of judges. I'd now like to introduce our judging panel who will be firing questions at the startups following their pitch. I'd like to welcome Matthew Beggs, Executive General Manager of Partnerships and Business Development at Lancome, Jennifer Harrison, Founding Committee Member and Vice President of the PropTech Association Australia, and Don Wright, Head of Launchpad Innovation Program at Western Sydney University. You as the audience will also have an opportunity to fire your questions at the startups during their pitch. The teams are online as we speak and ready to answer anything that comes their way. I will now hand it over to our entrepreneur in residence, Jamie Pryor, to introduce the startups pitching today. Three years ago, Justin started InSpace because he couldn't understand the floor plans for his new home. This year, Justin was featured in the Forbes 30 under 30 list. Welcome, Justin. Every year, the building industry spends $55 billion in construction mistakes because people still struggle to understand floor plans. And so InSpace is software that allows the building industry to instantly convert their CAD design files 
into a virtual simulation within seconds. This means the architects, the client, the engineering consultants can walk through a space before that space is actually built. Users can create an online model and share it easily across desktop, mobile, and VR. And they also have access to a range of tools, for example, uh, to mark up, to see the building information, the ability to measure things, and also to simulate uh, accurate solar. So InSpace is subscription software for $70 a month for unlimited use and is for the architects of tomorrow. InSpace also runs a digital consultancy called InSpace Studio. And InSpace Studio creates customized solutions, whether that's for property sales and marketing, whether that's to create a virtual showroom for interiors products. And we're always asking what if. What if we could roam entire cities from the comfort of our own home, past, present, and future? And what if we could learn in ways that are more memorable out of this world? Would we plan differently if we could see through the walls and floors? At InSpace Studio, we say yes. We say that virtually anything is possible. Thanks. I love this use case for technology. I think it's absolutely amazing. I have a question in terms of feedback you've been getting from architects and feedback from the people who will actually occupy the space because you've almost got two client bases there. How do you manage that? Yeah, um, we've been in market for just over two years now when we have um, over 200 enterprise clients and they range from architecture to engineering to workplace design. So it depends on um, who you are. So we know that for small to medium architects, it's really about communicating a design to an end client in a way so that they're on the same page and the client can make decisions with more confidence mm -hmm. um, and quicker. Um, we know for workplace design, it's you know how do you plan the space and get the work force involved in the design of that space. For construction and engineering, it's about viewing potential clashes before they actually happen on site. So yeah, the use cases vary. Okay, thank you. Mm. Thanks, Justin. Uh, I'm interested to hear about your team. What's behind the curtain? Yeah, great. Um, so I'm lucky to lead the team as CEO and founder. Um, I've got a background in corporate venture capital where I specialize in virtual reality and artificial intelligence. Um, yeah, business is really a sport for me. I sold my first events business when I was 21. Um, Daniel Littlepage is the general manager for our in-space studio business. He was a former Q at 90 seconds where he oversaw the growth for 120 countries. Uh, Racing is our country manager. Um, he's got 15 years in the building industry and is the go-to guy for VR um, within architecture. We're also lucky to be um, backed by some pretty clever people, including Taronga Group, who are um, Asia Pacific's leading prop tech fund, uh, Investable, Artesian, um, and, and some other investors as well. Hmm. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. Great, right, thank thanks. you very much. Thanks, Justin. It's an interesting company, that one. It's got a lot of potential, I think. Potential. Yeah, I, I, and I it's, agree. Yeah. It's really, an, and, and it, I can see it starts as an efficiency tool, yeah. but then it becomes an engagement tool, a creativity mm. tool, mm. a data yeah. Yeah. collection device. Don't forget while the startups pitch, you can ask them questions via the Slido app. It's fairly common for us to see that much of the technology we use daily is developed in the Bay Area and Silicon Valley and exported to Australia. Well, Aquacell is reversing this trend. Their systems are designed and built in Western Sydney and installed in the Bay Area and beyond. Introducing Hugh Fisher from Aquacell. Good morning, everyone. My name's Hugh Fisher and I work in business development for Aquacell. We exist simply because water should be used more than once. Often we hear of single-use plastic and renewable energy, but the conversation very rarely shifts to single-use water. By looking at water in the same context, we can provide an infinite value and use of a finite resource. We're a 100% privately owned Australian business with operations in Australia and in the USA. We're water and wastewater design, build and operate experts, and we have a private utility license, or multiple of them, in New South Wales. By 2025, two thirds of the world's population may be facing water shortages. Increasing population, agriculture and industry, paired with the societal propensity for single use water, will increase drought impacts of the future and water shortages. Our solution simply is to use water more than once. Strategic implementation of decentralized water recycling systems will reduce the strain on potable water systems, provide irrigation water and mitigate the urban heat island effect. As shown, our competitive position is promising. 
Our management team, regulatory factors and momentum are all the basis for our positive business assessment. As Jamie alluded to before, we often see technology being developed in Silicon Valley and the Bay Area and exported here. We're reversing the trend of that, with two of our highest profile projects being the new Facebook campus in Silicon Valley and the Salesforce Tower in San Francisco. Back home, we've recently installed Australia's first membrane aerated bioreactor system as part of the world's first shopping centre in the world that's targeting Living Building Challenge certification, the Burwood Brickworks project. All of these projects are the, some of the highest profile in the world, with their rigorous innovation and sustainability processes all leading to the same solution. Aquacell, thank you. Well, thanks, Hugh. Yeah, thanks, Hugh. Yeah. Thank you, Hugh. Um, I love the term you've used of single-use water, and I think you. that you know we have a moral responsibility to get a lot better at how we use water. I'm interested to know, in terms of your private utility licence, um, and how that could, licensing arrangement could be of benefit in residential developments, particularly in regional or, or fringe areas? Yes, so the private utility licence allows private companies such as ours to provide you know, infrastructure such as a Hunter Water or a Sydney Water would provide for a metropolitan area. In a lot of kind of cases, when you're developing on the fringes of, um, of regional areas, there isn't an access to sewer and it's not feasible necessarily for the big public utilities to provide that service for a smaller development. Companies like us can provide that service through a private utility licence and therefore expand the kind of the area for development in fringe areas by providing that service, which is a condition of development approvals. Thank you. Mm. So you guys are here in the driest continent in the world, I think we are. Yes. And you're developing the best technology in the world and we're exporting it to the USA. What's happening in the Australian market? Uh, there is a bit happening in the Australian market. We do have a lot of installations, particularly across Sydney and Melbourne. Uh, with some in Brisbane and in Perth as well. The reason for the export to San Francisco is that there's a mandate for recycled water in that area, right. which requires new developments of a certain size to include on-site decentralised water recycling, which there is talk and progression in bringing that in here. And Australia was initially, particularly Sydney and Melbourne, ahead of San Francisco a number of years ago in the millennium drought. Right. We've kind of fallen off a little bit, but now we're looking to, to pick it back up. And, and as you want to grow the company now with the whole COVID-19 situation, what does that mean for the future, the next couple of years, at least in terms of the international market? Is there still demand there that you're seeing? Yes, definitely. I mean, the COVID thing is quite an interesting one. I mean, it probably lends itself quite well to bringing things further here as well. Yeah. But we're looking at kind of decentralising our workforces globally as a result of COVID. And having a decentralised workforce would mean decentralised utilities, such as decentralised water recycling. So it's transferable across the world in that right. context. Okay. Cool. Thanks, Hugh. So we're sitting here in the middle of the year um, and, and it's almost as though the bushfire season is a distant memory with everything else that's been going on. So to, to bring us back to something you mentioned around urban heat island effect, um, how will it help? Well, the most kind of well-renowned or the most well kind of justified mechanism of mitigating the heat, urban heat island effect is to increase the greenery in, in urban areas. And in a drought-stricken country, as Don mentioned before, it's difficult to you know, provide greenery, greenery without a source of sustainable irrigation water. So having decentralised water recycling systems can provide a constant supply of sustainable water for irrigation, which kind of lends itself nicely to, to greening the urban areas as well. Mm. Thank you. Thanks, Hugh. Right. Thanks, Thanks, Hugh. Hugh. Thank well you. done. Thanks. I mean, the drought we've just come out of forced mm. most of us into probably the most conservative use of water. Parts of the state were on level four, level five. I yeah. think we need yeah. we need that lived experience yeah. ourselves to start saying, I don't want to flush my toilet with potable single use water. Yeah. You know? Our, our <laughs> children will think we were crazy. Yeah, that's right. yeah. The idea that you flush a toilet with drinking water is insane. Just a reminder, if you want to chat with any of our founders, they're online right now. Rebecca, the founder of Verimus, received the Gold Digital Disruptor from the Australian Computer Society in 2019, a prestigious national award for digital disruption in 3D communication. Verimus is now spearheading the way we engage with rich 3D. Welcome. Thank you. 3D is a rich data source that is underutilised as 3D is not supported in mobile apps in the same way 2D photos, graphics and videos are. To explain 3D information today, we still have to reduce 3D to 2D, such as plans, renders, fly-through videos, which are all static and result in information loss. 
So we developed Spacebar to reduce expensive and labor-intensive 2D processes for when you have 3D, which is a higher dimension. At Verimus, we have extensive experience in 3D technology and spatial computing. The ethos that drives our journey stems from the belief that information is currency, where 3D is a rich, bite-sized nugget of information that's bottlenecked due to the lack of digital tools. So Spacebar is a cloud solution to democratize 3D. It's an augmented reality app that would make 3D useful and available in a mobile device. We welcome opportunities to custom develop mobile bite-sized digital twins for development and building management companies and uh, opportunities to support ongoing 3D communication and engagement in development projects and generally projects that would extend the usability of 3D. Thank you. Hmm. Thanks, Rebecca. I'm really interested in the usability of a mobile device. I'm interested, number one, who your user is. Is it a construction worker? Is it a planning um, you know, person within government? Is it a member of the community that learns to learn, wants to learn more about a development? Who are the different users, number one? And then how effective is a mobile device really in being able to interface effectively with a digital twin, particularly in a technical sense for a construction worker yes. or a, an engineer or someone like that? Spacebar is actually um, like WhatsApp in augmented reality space. So it allows you to communicate 3D that you wouldn't normally, you know, there are challenges with 3D when it comes to mobility of it. And only a few people actually get access to 3D unless you're a BIM manager or someone in the office with, with a 3D viewer. But in this case, what we wanted to do is actually make 3D part of our daily language. It would just you know, give us more insight, whether it's in construction or preventive maintenance. And So um, who is the user? Who's the user? The user would be community, planners, government, stakeholders of, right. of a building development. Even within an office space in, uh, in an architecture office, only some would have 3D skills. So you're sort of democratising access to Correct. the digital twin. Mm. Okay. All right. Okay. <laughs> and are you creating the digital twin or are you taking a digital twin that someone else has created and making it suitable for consumption in mobile format? We basically create the digital twin. So the di digital twin is that, you know, fusion of data, mm -hmm. real-time data with your 3D asset. So anyone with a 3D asset, basically we can optimize it, which is one of the challenges to make 3D useful and actually make it available to many. It's always been um, the uh, interoperability of a 3D or it's got very large file size. So to mm -hmm. optimize it is always a challenge. Mm -hmm. So how do you manage that optimization for uh, a mobile device? Yeah. If I've got a poor mobile signal out on a construction site somewhere, what are the technical issues in, in access for the digital twin through 3G or you know, hopefully 5G in the future? Hi, my name is Con and I'm a CTO of the Verimus. So what you just mentioned, so yes, yeah, so even if you have a very poor 3G reception, right? So you still should be able to exchange that information with the other users. So basically the mobile gets into your device, you can pre-download it or you can actually uh, download it on the go. Yeah. And yes, it could be optimized on our servers in the cloud. So one of the you know, challenges that we had is basically since mobile application is just like a tip of the iceberg, you know, we, were, we are building, you know, this cloud infrastructure behind and it's supposed to be carrying all those tasks. So that's one of them. Okay, all right, mm -hmm. great. And okay. just, just one final yep. one on, uh, on development projects and the ability to use it as an engagement tool is, is very interesting. Um, yes. Have you had experience in that so far? Yes. Um, yes, uh, I've had many projects where, you know, we've had to develop uh, augmented reality um, solutions for, especially in um, areas that are quite remote. So mm. I've actually had to go out to the Pilbara Desert a few times and uh, and I was engaged in, in creating a solution basically to, to try to capture some of the members of the community who could not understand anything, you know, to do with 
2D plans. We're mm. talking even doctors. It, there were development projects for hospitals in Punmu and Pangar, which is um, quite remote. So I think in terms of having a higher dimensional asset that's already available, making that um, you know part of your discussion just really helped others to understand. So, you know, our experience was that it was actually a very positive experience where members of the communities were able to participate in in discussion and um, more importantly in making um, commentary about the building as to how they want it to be done. So, All right, thanks. great. Yes, yeah, thanks. Thanks. guys. Thanks. Excellent. Thanks very much. Okay, thank you. Thanks, 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 I think in that community engagement context, you know, you really make it really accessible. You, know, you really lift the accessibility of. If you want to know more about any startup, the founders are online now and ready to take your questions. With the partnership extending over 25 years, Starwater founders and technology inventors Eric Love and Christopher Rochford have given society many groundbreaking environmental technologies and practices in the stormwater recycling waste, agriculture, landscape and construction markets, including innovations that are now commonplace in the Australian community, such as wheelie bin systems and composting recyclable organic waste. Welcome Starwater. Thank you, Jamie. Rarely does a technology emerge that solves threatening environmental crises such as climate change, water pollution and waste recycling, while simultaneously lowering costs and increasing economic, social and environmental sustainability. Starwater computer designed advanced stormwater biofiltration systems do. Improving on sandy loam filters, star systems hold the future, effectively removing pollutants like heavy metals, nutrients, hydrocarbons and bacteria from stormwater runoff, protecting human health and safety. Biofilter plants collapse in sandy loam but thrive in star systems. The secret is custom designed reactive filter meter containing high recycle content that physically, chemically and biologically removes pollutants. Significantly advanced biofilter functionality reduces customers' capex and opex costs. More efficient hydrology enables smaller biofilter footprints, producing higher lot yield and lowering the cost of housing development. High performance, low cost, long lasting, cost effective star stormwater filter meter is welcomed by contractors building wussed detention basins and rain gardens. Star systems produce recycled stormwater for reuse, alleviating imposing water restrictions. Validated technology position star to access the $100 trillion climate responsive infrastructure investment required to meet the 2030 Global Paris Agreement targets. Connecting to the current projects like Western Sydney Development, gaining research connections and securing capital, our expert team will continue its purpose to give communities clean, safe waterways and harvested reuse water, creating a more livable and sustainable environment for everybody. Thank you, Eric. You mentioned um, the reactive filter being made of recycled product. What are we recycling? We initially started uh, recycling recycled organic materials because uh, we did some uh, work back in um, 2000, in the mid 2000s, to see whether recycled organics could play a role in treating water. Mm. So the first blends had the recycled organics, but we've recently uh, installed a 100% recycling. Uh, biofiltration basin in Newcastle. Uh, so now we're recycling glass, wood, uh, and also uh, recycled organics from the curbside. Right. Thank you. I'm just really interested in the go-to-market strategy. So who is your customer? I know in this instance you work with consulting engineers and contractors and councils and construction firms. Who do you primarily sell to? I'm interested in. I'd like to invite Chris Rochford to the podium to answer that question. Thanks, Eric. Yeah, it's, it's actually all of the above. So we have different um, influencing methodologies and that for each uh, uh, target uh, audience that we uh, target for uh, selling products and that too, whether it's the councils or construction companies. But the main influences are the uh, consulting engineers and the regulators and that. And they're the ones that we, uh, we influence initially uh, and be able to provide them with our uh, long-term data on, uh, on uh, how these products work more superior than the conventional. 
and then we uh, target the councils and the construction companies on a one-on-one -on -one basis. So have you been able to get your products written into technical specifications and scoping documents? Yes, uh, we're just at that stage where we've been able to do that. And right. uh, uh, Transport New South Wales, for instance, has specified right. our products in <coughs> through an influencer which is a landscape architect. Yeah. So it's a, it's a two-way uh, approach to that. And, uh, and so we've got it written into there. We've got standards that we've uh, established, industry standards, voluntary ones at this stage. Uh, and they are helping to advise and, uh, and that every Everybody involved in putting these sorts of systems in to make sure that they're more advanced than what we've put in in the past. I know there is a lot of willingness in the corporate world to move towards more sustainable solutions, but at the end of the day, there has to be a value proposition. Um, I'm interested to hear you talk a little bit more about the capex and opex savings on the one side, but also the quality control on the other side, because obviously you've got to be as clean or fit for purpose as something that is new. So how do you ensure that that is the case, but at the same time achieve cost savings? We've had an extensive you know, program of testing over the last, well, 10 years, uh, uh, assessing the quality of different components. And we select our components specifically, we're, we're local. So when you're talking about cost savings, cost savings come from the lower cost inputs, mm -hmm. but those inputs are also scientifically tested to make sure their uh, one their their efficacy is high and also that they don't cause any environmental harm so uh, the the proposition for you know cost savings in terms of opex and capex the operational costs because we, we have higher efficiency than the current technology which is uh, sandy loam filters so because we've got higher efficiency we're able to shrink the footprint now, when you shrink the footprint, obviously you've got you know, less product going into there, you create more space, so you get higher lot yield, which, which lowers the cost of, of housing on that particular development. Uh, so high uh, specifications for those materials, uh, scientific testing, we have an accreditation system for those materials that tests them for uh, you know, things like environmental stability and, uh, and efficacy. So those tests are carried out pretty well uh, on, on every occasion that we, uh, that we try a new material. Perfect. So you win-win. You're better for the environment <laughs> and better for the profit line. Yeah. Love it. Right. Excellent. Thank, Thank you. you. Mm, terrific. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thanks, Thank Eric. You. Thanks, Chris. And the idea that it lasts longer and uses a yeah. lower footprint, yeah. oh, that's genius. Yeah. yeah. I'm still right. interested in what they're... Um, putting in, uh, I think that'll be just, it'll be interesting. Yeah, yeah. Whether it is a truly sustainable material. Just a reminder that the founders are online right now, ready to answer any questions you might have. Kirk is the CEO of the Mobile Apps Man, an innovation-driven app development company specialising in holographic computing. They've had the privilege of providing innovative solutions to companies like Subway, James Hardy, Parramatta Mission, and the Royal Society for the Blind. Welcome, Kurt. Thank you. Good day, Kurt. Royal Adelaide Hospital, ladies and gentlemen. Fantastic little place if you haven't been there. Original budget, $1.7 billion. Completed some five years later to the tune of a whopping $2.4 billion, ladies and gentlemen. That makes this little sucker the third most expensive building in the world. How could you ever possibly expect to get quality design feedback from those who are not architecturally trained. How could a nurse from a two-dimensional floor plan envisage having line of sight issues by looking at plans purely? Ladies and gentlemen, I introduce to you the world of holographic computing. No more is this in the realms of the movie makers only. This technology exists today and we are already out there providing solutions to companies. In a recent trial, we have developed software that a local council used to convert a multi-storey sports complex into a holographic experience, allowing them to fully scale from very small to full size. It's voice controlled, hand gesture controlled, and we could see it even in situ. 82% of the respondents after the trial claim that this technology should be used for any significant LGA developments in future. Ladies and gentlemen, we're open to 
Hearing from anyone who has any holographic ideas that they wish to pursue or any app development. Thank you. Thanks, Kurt. Thanks, Kurt. So, I mean, this sort of, uh, I'll call it mixed reality, I suppose, type development, yep. obviously very um, capital intensive to, to maintain a, a technological advantage in this space. So what sort of, uh, you know, what sort of capability do you have to keep developing the tech and how are you going to build in an IP protection strategy so that you can, you know, ward off all the massive competitors that are going to be coming in against you? Okay, we have a team of uh, trained, great uh, programmers who develop the software to physically take and convert CAD drawings. Converting CAD drawings into a holographic experience certainly isn't the easiest thing out there. So we find that if we're out there and our robustness and potentially close to first to market or you know uh, in this space, then uh, that should certainly. So again, you've got that scaling issue. So if you're a, you're essentially a service company, how are you going to scale that service company into a much bigger enterprise? Ultimately, the uh, the idea essentially is by putting this onto a SaaS platform right. and scaling that way. Okay. All right. Great. Okay, guys. Hi, are there any other use cases that you're exploring beyond what you've presented to us today? Uh, absolutely. Uh, probably two in, in, uh, in, in form. So basically taking any CAD drawing really, so that includes those. So we've, we've worked with a, uh, a metal fabricator, so taking their, uh, their CAD drawings from vessels, large vessels, we can physically walk onto their factory floor before build, so we can then already assess how big it's going to be on their, their factory floor and, and how they may uh, manoeuvre around it. And the second is, is probably a, a forensic scientist um, uh, application that we're looking at. Interesting. Thank you. Yeah, I'm, I'm interested in hearing from you about how you think this might be different to other products that are either in the market or emerging. Uh, you know, what, what's your place in the market going to be? Holographic experiences basically allows you to combine headsets so we can all uh, collaboratively look at the one um, you know, design all together. How it differs from other things available, so virtual reality for argument's sake, is these are completely untethered devices, so you can physically take them you know, on site to situations uh, where you, you know, may want to see a building, as we did for uh, this LGA, see the building on site and be able to walk around it prior to it even being developed. Great. Thank you. Thanks, Kirk. Well done. Thank you, Kirk. Thank you. Thanks, Kirk. I like the, the headset because it's a much more portable, much mm. more physically, you know, not as cumbersome as the VR. Yeah, and you're in I the think, real world as opposed to in your little box. That's right, yeah, it's that mix, the mixed reality <laughs> sort of. Yeah. Want to know more? Drop your question into Slido. Income Energy's founding team has experience in running a startup in Silicon Valley, structuring commercial contracts, and deep expertise in solar and the energy industry. Alex, Daniel and Rommel won the 2018 Origin Energy Hackathon, solving the low uptake of solar on commercial rooftops by making solar a managed investment solution for landlords. Welcome Income Energy. Hey. G'day. Hi, I'm Rommel, co-founder of Income Energy. Since June last year, industrial properties have been struggling with lower yields and rents being flat. In contrast, solar represents a massive opportunity as shown in this image of Wetherill Park. We were only able to count four solar systems installed on Australia's largest industrial estate. The Clean Energy Finance Corporation suggests that the total solar potential for commercial and industrial properties is huge. We created a novel way to help commercial landlords invest in solar, sell power to their tenants, and earn extra income that is equivalent to an extra month of rent each year. At the same time, tenants have now have access to cleaner and cheaper energy. Our solution also makes tenants stickier and increases the property value. Our team has 40 plus years of collective experience in solar and are passionate about unlocking the huge potential for this technology. We're working with our initial customers and expect the first installation to come in upcoming months. We're also trying to raise capital soon. If you are passionate about solar and helping Australian SMEs, please contact us for a more in-depth discussion. We look forward to for your support on our journey to revolutionize both solar and property investment. Thank you. Thanks, Ronald. Thank you. Um, hi, guys. Thank you for that. 
I'd like to know how things have been different for you this year. Are you seeing more traction, more interest in what you're doing? Because I imagine, you know, I know small business is doing it tough. Um, industrial landlords are part of that picture and they're doing it even tougher than they were before. How Are you in the right place at the right time, I suppose, is another way of putting, um, putting this question, given the pandemic that we currently are facing? Things have slowed down because of uncertainty, but we're still progressing a lot of, uh, uh, of our uh, sales opportunities. We're now also working with Property New South Wales mm -hmm. uh, in reviewing some of their uh, sites. And uh, we're partnering with Wall Watchers to roll out some of their hardware. And so, but our target customers are retail fast food shops um, and manufacturers. Mm -hmm. And so they're still uh, working and it's just a matter of uh, getting them on board. Mm. Can, can you just break the model down for me really simply, right? So you're, you're selling to a landlord who owns a commercial premises and you're gonna get them to basically put the solar on the roof. The income stream that's generated from the solar will reduce the cost of the energy bill for the tenant of the building. Is that the model? Oh, just shuffle okay. over. So if you're a landlord, um, we would approach you to do a proposal, to build a proposal for investing solar on your property. What that would mean is we would install an energy monitor so that we could get five minute data on your tenant's usage. That way we can optimize the solar system that's installed, not necessarily for what is technically the best system, but for what is economically the best system to get you the best returns. Um, we'd put that proposal in front of you and then we'd be able to tailor it to maximise revenue, max minimise payback period or increase ROI. If that was something that you were interested in and gets you the extra month of rent, which is what we tell most landlords, um, you would then invest in the solar system. We would project manage the install of the system and then we would take care of the system for the lifetime, doing all the billing, all the approvals, all the maintenance, everything like that they will receive an increase in their rental income potentially from the property Basically. because it's got solar on the roof. Yeah. Right, and there's a reduction for the tenant in their energy bill, is yeah. what you're saying. Yeah, right. we, we target about a 10 to 20% reduction in the tenant's energy bill. Yeah. I'm interested in hearing about the barriers you've had to overcome to get to where you are, and then maybe a little bit of what would be stopping you from taking it even further. What barriers do you need to overcome? Mm. I'll this one. Yeah. Uh, I had some experience working in commercial rooftop sales for the owner-occupier section. And that's pretty difficult in itself. It seems easy. you just got one person to deal with. They're running the company and they own the building. Yeah. But that's two different mentalities. One is their day-to-day -day operation of the business and the other is that they're an investor. So getting them to sit down and to talk about solar investments when they'd actually prefer to put the money into their business and have their business be successful. So that has its, its, its first level to overcome. But what I found was that there was an aversion to work with rental uh, tenants, mm -hmm. because the tenants aren't mm -hmm. going to generally be in a financial position where they'd invest mm -hmm. for a five year turnaround. Yeah. Whereas the landlords are in it generally for a lot longer than five years. So our problem was how do we actually enter this market to begin with? So it's more complex in the financial structures. So we had to sit down and develop these whole, you know, spreadsheet models from scratch. And then we got some interns to do some programming so we could figure out how we could do this in a more automated and scalable way. So that's where we got up to it, let's say when in the normal days. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Since then, we have had to think about how we approach our business in these times. And so that's where we've, we've looked to more for the New South Wales government or for the larger ones, which we know is gonna be a, a longer lead time, but a more substantial lead time, which we, we thought that that's the appropriate challenge for the moment. Great. All right, guys, good. Thank yeah, you. Thank you. Robert. Excellent. Alex, All right. Daniel. Thank you. Thanks. Well done. I think that, that storage issue, it's just one that, you know, we're still trying to crack the nut on mm. really broadly, you know. Mm. And in that commercial uh, sector, you will come up against that mm. multiple shifts, particularly in manufacturing. Art and Lab is brought to you by a team that has over 15 years experience in virtual reality, 3D simulations and artificial intelligence. They've built some of the most popular simulated games, including Rise, Crisis and Warface. 
Today they'll be sharing how you can build high quality and interactive virtual reality experiences for real estate projects. Introducing Olga, the founder of Art and Lab. Hi, my name is Olga and today I wanted to talk about 3D visualization. Imagine you're selling an off-the-plan property. How do you sell your customer something that they cannot see? That's where our 3D visualization services come in handy. What's unique about us are world-class artists who work on the most popular video games. The quality of our designs is second to none. We build photorealistic exterior and interior renders. We are also skilled in video editing and can add 3D models into drawing footage of a construction site. We can even Photoshop out all the cranes and replace them with 3D animation. Apart from classical visualization services, we also create interactive 3D simulations where you can see the property in real time on your website, touch screen or touch table, and highlight additional features you want to show your customer to help them make decisions about buying. We also create bespoke virtual reality experiences. Virtual reality is a new and better way to do 3D visualization. Not only you get photorealistic renders and fly-throughs, but you actually also be able to walk through the property in real time, get the general feel, scale of the property, get to choose finishes and fit outs. So viewing a property in virtual reality headset is the closest thing to actually being there. So if you are in property development or real estate business, please get in touch. Thank you. Hmm. Thank you so much, Olga. I love that. I can see from the little videos you've had going there while you've been talking, the quality of the work is exceptional. So I'm curious to know more about your team and this mix of skills that they have. Well, our team is um, me, but I'm mostly um, responsible for business development, um, marketing, things like that. We also have Anton, who is a technical director. He's the one who has a lot of experience. You know, he has over 15 experience in artificial intelligence um, and and virtual reality as well. And our designers, um, we had a lot of friends um, who work in um, that industry, who create a lot of video games. Mm -hmm. So we did some projects together with them. Okay. It's uh, very mm. high quality and, and I can see a lot of the projects that you showcased in the video seem to be very high end. Mm. So again, in terms of um, how would you scale it up? Like not every project uh, people do is, is high end. How do you compare on cost? to likely competitors? Okay, so um, we actually did a bit of research um, about our competitors' pricing. And what it looks like on average, what you usually pay for 3D visualization for your fly-throughs and um, renders, we could build, you get the same thing with us, plus VR. Right. Because we actually can use a different engine to create virtual reality experience and then take renders from there. And it's actually a bit better as well. That's why we're thinking that's a better way of doing 3D visualization because, for example, if you do classical visualization and your customer wants to change something, it takes hours, even days sometimes, to re-render the photo. If it's built in virtual reality, it's hours, yeah. less than hours. And in, in this world now with um, COVID-19, so much of, of real estate yeah, is yeah, going to be via you know, mm. remote viewings. I mean, I think mm. you've just got Doing an amazing so. market opportunity, I think your challenge is going to be scale. It's going to, how do you reach that bigger market opportunity and, and, and provide a service that can, it can get out there. Yeah. Great. Well done. Thank you, All good. Olga. Thanks, Olga. Excellent. Thank you very Thank much. You. Well done. Thank you. Nice work. Thanks. Thank I think that business, if they could build in uh, customer feedback into the model so that as you viewed it, mm. either as a potential you know, buyer Recording. of real estate or whatever, mm. After working in construction for the last 10 years, Patrick understands more than most the damage high-risk contractors can cause. So in 2018, he developed a platform to help construction firms assess contractor risk in a fast, easy and reliable way before hiring them. Welcome. Thank you. COVID-19 has hit construction hard. Once stable and reliable contractors are now on the brink of collapse. If you're about to hand over the construction reins to a third party, you need to know that they can be trusted to deliver the project successfully. But finding this information has become a time-consuming and expensive task. That's why we build Anility, a cloud-based subscription platform that provides companies with accurate and reliable information to assess contractor risk in a fast and easy way. Financial and historical performance data is used to identify red flags within the contractors bidding on a project. Contractors are then compared against one another using a series of intuitive dashboards and reports. 
Once in construction, contractor performance is tracked and logged continuously throughout the build. At the completion of each project, data is stored in contractor risk profiles and reused on future evaluations. As a result, companies are able to make more informed, educated decisions that reduce risk and create a positive impact on the project budget, program and overall client satisfaction. We're currently piloting Annuity on projects across Australia and are looking for motivated companies to join us on our journey. If this sounds like you or you're interested in learning more, please get in touch. Thank you. Thanks very much. Just wondering how you get the contractors to engage in that process and provide them information. Provide the data. Potentially, um, if, if you're thinking about it, that might put them at a disadvantage if they're honest. Correct, yeah. So the two types of data that we get, we get financial data from the contractors. So it's important to note that the financial data we get is kept private and secure. So no one ever sees any of the numbers on a financial statement. Instead, mm -hmm. we've created a scoring system out of 100, which essentially demonstrates a company's financial capacity to take on new work. And the second type of data that we collect is by the customers directly. So they audit the performance of each contractor. And based off that, um, we remove any subjectiveness and bias. So it's a true indication of how they perform. So companies essentially that perform well will rise and the ones that don't will essentially um, float to the bottom. So who's, who's really taking it up now? What level of um, size of construction company is so our, now? our target market ideally is uh, principal contractors, so builders um, with turnover over 10 mil. So obviously right. the greater size project, um, the greater risk and the more benefit annuity provides. Um, we've also started to see a lot of benefit out of councils, um, yep. especially by automating those time consuming processes. So we don't necessarily just provide a check, but we've developed risk analysis tools that we can then use that information and apply it to the project. So are you always aiming at that bigger end of the market or do you see it being able to go back down into the smaller contractors Yeah, as well? eventually. So we're sort of taking a top to the bottom approach. Right. So we're starting with you know um, owners essentially, so government yeah. type of thing, councils that engage with principal contractors and then subcontractors. So by doing that, they'd invite these contractors to the platform and then we can build from the bottom up and help subcontractors verify that builders pay them, yep. et cetera. Hi, Pat. Um, hey. I can definitely see how this helps principal contractors select subcontractors. What if I've already got subcontractors I'm working with? Have you got utility there in terms of benchmarking for performance and governance and things of those nature? Definitely. So the way that construction is obviously a relationship driven industry and pre-existing relationships are always going to mean a lot. But the approach we're taking is we're not saying replace these pre-existing relationships, but we're sort of saying, you know, embrace technology and use our data to support and drive better decision making. So, you know, within the platform, we've obviously got <clears throat> benchmarking mm -hmm. so that you can actually compare your existing contractors versus the market mm -hmm. and, you know, another of um, tools that can help manage the, the contractors that you already have in place. Mm. Perfect. Well, it gives them uh, the ability or um, you the ability to give them feedback about what might make a difference. Definitely. So that at the completion of each job, um, there's an opportunity or, or ongoing throughout the job where the subcontractor can review the audits that have been completed on them. And based off that, you can have a dialogue and conversation yeah. in areas that you believe they can improve and yeah. um, okay. so forth. It's good. Yeah. It's good business. Thanks yeah. very much. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Hey, well thank you. Thank you. Uh, nice work. But if you've got a big project and you're dealing with unique um, contractors, we often don't know much about them. Yeah. So mm. if you've got, got a way to, to and, and it, it is time consuming and expensive mm. yeah. to get those background checks. Yeah. Yeah. Be sure to throw your questions to the startups as they pitch using Slido. A business born out of its founders experiencing firsthand the costly outcomes of poor communication. Connexi makes sure that the right people have the right information at the right time and get a great outcome. Please welcome Jake Hannon pitching for Connexi. How's it going? Hello. Good. Good day. My name is Jake Cannon. I'm one of the co-founders of Connexi, along with Sebastian Jacobs and Matthew Wall. Connexi is designed and optimized for large groups of people who share a common interest but aren't on a common platform. Using Connexi, you can answer questions, solve problems, and share information, not only from people to people, but from devices to people as well. Our most exciting industry that we're in is energy. One of our customers is a car wash who is overusing 200 kilowatts of power every single morning. Utilizing Connexi, we were able to surface that data, put it in the hands of somebody who could action it, and save them money. The thing is, all this kind of data is everywhere right now, but using Connexi, you could put it in the hands of somebody who could do something about it and make it meaningful. Our team's comprised of three founders, all with experience in digital workflow optimization, and have done business across Asia, the United States, and Australia. 
In the first six months of this year, we've already booked in over $100,000 in annual reoccurring revenue locked into five-year contracts. By the end of this year, we're planning on more than doubling that up to $250,000 in annual reoccurring revenue. Now, we're definitely proud of the growth we've experienced as a company, but we've also done a lot for our customers as well. Optimizing over 1.8 million kilowatts of energy, equaling over $460,000. To find out how Connexi could help you, or if you want to jump on board, please reach out to the team. Thank you. Look, I, I, I guess I just want to know a bit more about what you actually, what it does. Yeah. What, what could it do? You know, we're in a, a, a property development business. Mm -hmm. what, what could Connexi bring to us? I think one of the cool things about Connexi is, as Jake said, what we're actually selling is the convenience of taking data, surfacing it in a way that's meaningful to someone, and then distributing it to the right person to do something. So like what we'd like to say about it is we get the right information to the right people at the right time for the right outcome. So really, if you could apply that to any vertical, that you can see where there's maybe a breakdown in streamlining of workflow, or if there's large teams and scale in a business where you don't have that straight one-to-one -one communication anymore, there's a whole bunch of different applications for it. Strata is an example of where we actually entered the market with our product because they do have uh, one person who channels a lot of different people's interests and needs and then tries to filter that information back out. So with Connexi, you close that communication gap. Okay, thank you. So does it have application then within, say, construction firms, um, large infrastructure developments, and how does it integrate with other systems that would be in place? I mean, they transfer information all the time between all the different stakeholders. And uh, So how, how did we build in another platform? Yeah, so we kind of look at it as we're the missing piece on all those other platforms. So Caltex, for example, uh, brought us in for a, a pilot study across their sites, and they have five sort of core software programs that they use, one for OH&S, one for their project management, one for accounting and payroll, things like that. But what they didn't have was that conduit piece, which they had you know, 7,000 um, retail facing staff. They're not gonna onboard those people and all those programs. What they did need was something light and easy to understand to channel them through to those things as needed. So like a bollard gets hit at the Caltech yeah. station, is that a maintenance problem or is it an oh &S problem? Well, actually it's both. So Connexi actually captures that information and distributes it to where it needs to go, which prior to us didn't actually happen. The, we introduced the oh &S team to the maintenance team while we were in that actual pilot <laughs> and they were sitting next to each other. Yeah. So what part of the property sector is your biggest target market then? At the moment, energy owns the green energy movement. Yeah. So we've partnered with some green energy finances and providers who actually go in and they say, hey, we're gonna install these things on your roofs. But what they didn't have was that turnkey solution, which was I'm the owner, I wanna see this data, I wanna see what it's, what, how it's meaningful to me and also how I can recuperate that investment. So we came in with them. So they install the hardware, where the software piece and the information distribution piece that actually makes it viable. Okay, okay, good. And is this driven from business rules in the background? Um, I mean, how do you actually design and implement what the customer mm. needs? Yes, yeah. so, so my background was business workflow mapping. And what we created and said did the product on this, which kind of is probably our special source, is a really agnostic back-end system that can actually be customizable to the decision tree of that business. Mm -hmm. So when you set up your account with Connexi, you can actually customize it to the way your workflow um, is as, as is, or you actually can sit with us and we can audit that process and actually streamline it beforehand and you can you know, get those, the, reap those benefits to start with as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, good. Yeah, really good, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Awesome. Thank okay. you, Jake. Thanks, guys. Thank Thanks you. For that. Thanks for your time. Thanks, Seb. Good one. Don't forget to keep those questions coming. Next up is Doug. Doug is the MD and co founder of Mast, a fast growing startup in the construction industry that provides real time Capital Works portfolio management systems for owners. Mast is currently in market and used by billions of dollars worth of projects in Australia and overseas, including the Australian Department of Defence. Welcome, Mast. Thank you, Jamie. Thanks for having me, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. So my name's Doug. I'm the Managing Director of Mast, and we're a Capital Works Portfolio Management System. So a bit of background. So when I joined this industry, I um, thought I'd be working on some really you know, major projects for big customers like the Department of Defence. So I joined headfirst into this world and basically found everyone was using spreadsheets to manage huge Capital Works portfolios. So I just really struggled with that. And for me, it's just no wonder that we have all of these huge projects blowing out, um, going over time and over budget. And it wasn't just the Department of Defence that had these issues. It was just across the whole market. So I worked for Department of Defence, State Government, 
local government and private clients. And I just saw this issue of spreadsheets blowing out projects, which is across the whole industry. Uh, and so I did that for seven years. And by the time of my end working in industry, I was a program manager managing large portfolio. Um, and that spreadsheet issue had really exacerbated itself to the point that I just had no real time information into any of my projects at all. And so we created Mast, which is really easy to use, elegant solution in a very complex capital works environment. And so we bring to the whole range of stakeholders in capital works a real time data driven environment that gets them totally off spreadsheets and documents. So they can actually make capital allocation decisions rather than have all this information trapped in thousands of spreadsheets and documents. So being able to reinvest capital, to do more work with the same amount of money <clears throat> in a way that they've never had before. So we launched in November last year. Things have been going really well. So we've got big customers like the Department of Defense, the Army, and also on the consulting side, Fortune 500 companies like Jacobs, RPS, Oricon, KPMG, et cetera. So we're in the middle of a funding round, actually. We're raising 1.5 million. We've been bootstrapped to date to nearly 750, 800 ARR in under 18 months. Um, but to fuel our growth um, and expand internationally, we've opened up a funding round and that's actually going really well and closing in September. So that's all from me. Thank you. Thank you, Doug. Thanks, Doug. Uh, great presentation. And I'm, I'm certainly familiar with trapping all my data and information inside spreadsheets and documents that are hard to access and then get sort of executive level real-time reporting on. I'm, I'm interested on how it might coalesce with other business systems that people use and they're mm -hmm. not all specifically the same for every business as you go around. So you're talking about in the ecosystem of other softwares in a capital mm. works owner? Yep. Yep. Yeah, so that's actually a funny one. Most of the time we're actually encountering spreadsheets or at best they have a SAP system. Mm -hmm. So there's just kind of nothing in that middle range. Um, so actually at, at best they'll have a SharePoint or something. So we're actually plugging this big gap in the middle of a really expensive, difficult to train on Oracle system and then a very low cost um, spreadsheet. So we're plugging that gap for all of our, all of our clients. That's really all we encounter mm. in that space, Thanks. which is good for us, obviously. Mm. Because once they get on, it's very hard to get off and go back to a spreadsheet. So I'm interested from an IP point of view. So you've got a first mover advantage. You said there's not a lot of other um, products in the market. Mm -hmm. How are you going to um, defend against competition coming into this space? Because I mean, this is a big industry, lots of money. There will no doubt be competition. What sort of IP strategies or what sort of technology are you looking to embed? Good question. So there's a few aspects to that, but our main competitive advantage at the moment is having distilled all of this complexity into a really simple system. So that can only be done with input from industry. Uh, and then once you actually get customers onto the system and they start building up a level of data and level of reliance on the system, mm -hmm. it's basically impossible for them to get off. So we've got projects that go out to 2028 and those projects are not getting off the system. They just can't go back to a spreadsheet. So they have to keep going. The cost of changing to an Oracle is too high. So that's great for us. It gives us a really good moat around the business. Mm. So we're defendable from outside threats. But yeah, if you want to add to that, yeah. perhaps on the yeah. information and cybersecurity side of things. Mm. As well. So I'm Jamie Surex, the head of engineering. Uh, so in terms of defensibility and, and how we protect ourselves from other competitors, what we're really investing in is how we use data. So we're collecting a lot of data on all these projects. And the status quo at the moment is that, you know, companies record all this data, they do the job properly, but then they just throw it in some archived hard drive that is so big that they can't even open it on most of their computers anymore. And so we spend a lot of time trying to work out uh, as our amount of data grows, how can we use techniques like machine learning okay, to be able to tell the project managers and portfolio managers whether their projects are going well or not. And as we get more of that data in this first move advantage, we'll be much more effective than other yeah. systems. Great. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, guys. All right. Thank Thanks, you. guys. Thanks very much. Okay. Yeah. Thanks for coming. We hope you enjoyed hearing from the Urban Futures 2020 cohort. If any of them sparked your interest, please get in touch via Slido. That concludes the formal pitches for this event, but don't leave just yet. We'll now be hosting a brief panel and discuss the opportunities for prop tech startups in Western Sydney and how you can get involved. 
As Australia's third largest and fastest growing regional economy, Western Sydney is an engine room of economic development that is critical to the overall growth of Australia's innovation ecosystem. It delivers the potential to leverage the wide range of infrastructure development and other investment that is occurring through major projects such as the Western Sydney Airport in Aerotropolis and the range of innovation precinct developments. These developments offer an excellent platform to support local tech startup capability, especially in the prop tech space. To unpack the future of prop tech innovation and what this could mean for Western Sydney, I'd like to welcome the following members to join me on this panel. First, I'd like to introduce Liz Dibb, who is the Western Sydney District Commissioner at Greater Sydney Commission. She's also the Deputy Chancellor of Western Sydney University and Chair of its Audit and Risk Committee, Chairman of United Way Australia and Governor of the Centenary Institute of Cancer Medicine and Cell Biology. Our second panel member is Jamie Pride, our entrepreneur in residence at Western Sydney University Launchpad. He's also a partner at Corn Ferry, a former venture capitalist and best-selling author of Unicorn Tears. He has more than 20 years leadership and consulting experience with international technology and digital media organisations, including leading realestate.com.au as their CEO. Our third panel member is Maureen Wade. Maureen is the Manager of Infrastructure and Innovation for Lancom. Her role includes coordination for infrastructure delivery and promoting innovation across Lancome's development portfolio. Maureen also leads Lancome's strategic alliance with Western Sydney University's Launchpad. Thank you panel members for being here at Launchpad Penrith and on this panel today. Jamie, I'd like to start with you. We've just seen a range of great prop tech ideas pitched by our Urban Futures cohort, covering engagement platforms, intelligent planning tools, smart sustainability products, VR and others. Where do you think some of the strongest market opportunities are for emerging startups in the prop tech space right now? Um, thanks, Beck. Look, I think uh, in a post-COVID environment, uh, there's a huge amount of opportunity, especially if I look at construction and capital works projects. So if you think about what's going to happen from a government investment standpoint, and generally, I think you're going to see substantial capital works investment, both in Australia and abroad. And so I think that property tech startups that address that particular segment of the market, I think are going to do really well. I also think sustainability. Uh, sustainability has been a theme for, for many, many years, and even more so. So, you know, we've seen some uh, startups as part of this cohort that are focused on you know water treatment and water reuse and I think that those themes will continue to be uh, you know very popular over the coming months. Amazing and I know sustainability is a big focus for Lancome so that might just lead me to the next question for Maureen. You lead innovation for Lancome, the State Government Property Development Corporation and you have a long planning and development background. How do you think the role of startups is changing the future of the property industry? I think there's a real appetite for change within our organisation and certainly within the industry. I think the startups really can help energise what we do um, to help us think, think about doing things differently. Already we've had a great deal of interest from within the organisation. People are really interested. It makes us ask questions and it makes us want to do things differently. Uh, so I think it's, you know, it's just really um, a fantastic opportunity for the industry to embrace um, the startup community. Amazing. You've had first-hand experience in the Urban Futures program. Can you think of any of the startup um, in that program where you see a real opportunity with Lancome? Look, I think they nearly all have um, opportunities. You know, the hologram idea was completely new to me, but I think, you know, for development managers, if they can um, sit in a room and uh, watch construction activity going on via a hologram, it's a whole new world for us. I think some of the platforms that Jamie referred to for program management, what we really need in the industry is visibility. We're trying to coordinate a lot of activities. Things go wrong. We need to be able to problem solve. We've got visibility on information uh, and there's so much power in the information. We, we gather a lot of information. Uh, we need to be able to use that to better what we do, to inform our, our consultants, our contractors, uh, the community that we develop for. So, I mean, certainly in the sustainability space, I think Starwater, for example, those people in Starwater have a great depth of experience and industry knowledge. And I think, you know, bringing that into the startup environment, we really need to try and embrace that. Liz, your role involves a massive job in planning and supporting the development of a large part of Western Sydney. What sort of opportunities do high growth areas such as Western Sydney offer for prop tech startups and how can they best get engaged? 
Um, so look, it is a pretty exciting place to be, Western Sydney. There's a lot going on and I guess the, the key themes in our planning at the Commission and, and through government is uh, the ideas of the 30 minute city, a really sustainable city, livable, productive, places where you can live, work and play. Sustainability is a big, a big theme. Um, so there's so much construction going on and infrastructure that's going to connect this city. We're looking at a course of themes of local centres, the metropolitan cluster cities. So the overarching theme in all of that is how we make the Western city really the smart city of the future, that city that leapfrogs Sydney to a new level. And I think in that context, there's just so much opportunity for the startup community and the accelerator community and these sort of programs to really embrace, let's face it, what is one of the biggest industries um, across Western Sydney. So I think it's a huge opportunity. It certainly fits with the government vision and certainly the Commission's vision for Western Sydney. So a huge opportunity. I think also in the post-COVID world, you know, local procurement is getting a lot more airplay. Mm -hmm. And I think we certainly know we have to be self-sustaining um, as best we can. And I think that provides a really you know, wonderful opportunity as we as we move to what I think um, the university and and we all know can be an incredible Western economic corridor, and and most importantly a Western elevation corridor. So it's a huge opportunity for us and for the construction industry right now. Amazing. So we've talked a little bit about the opportunities. So Jamie, what are some of the challenges you see for the prop tech sector in Australia? Do we have any niche market areas we could focus on to develop strong global opportunities? Uh, yeah, look, I mean, I think, uh, you know, we're going into a, a reasonably strong economic downturn. Um, I think we can all sort of assume that's going to happen. Uh, property tech spans a very broad range of subsectors. Uh, I think real estate will suffer. So if you think about, you know, residential real estate will certainly, I think, have some level of depression around, you know, consumer sentiment and people losing their jobs. I think commercial real estate is, is going to struggle as people start to look at new ways of working and, and looking at working from home as a choice rather than as a necessity. Uh, and I think, though, that presents an opportunity. So if you think about uh, built environment visualisation, um, if you think about uh, 3D fly-throughs, you know, VR experiences where people don't necessarily want to travel to view property, for example, um, but they may want to look at, you know, commercial real estate at a distance. Um, I think there's opportunities uh, for people to look at, you know, some of those ways of working and how that interferes with, you know, potential, you know, investment plans around commercial property and, you know, what we can do in that space. I think Australia also has a very, very strong sustainability um, you know, set of credentials. And so there are a couple of startups in, in this uh, cohort, for example, that focus on solar energy and looking at how uh, people can increase their rental yields for their commercial properties by installing solar panels, for example. So, look, I think that, you know, as the, the uh, cliche goes, in every crisis there's an opportunity. Um, and I think we're going to see some structural changes. And, you know, I think that the interesting thing about startups is that they are adaptable and flexible you know, and they can pivot to meet, you know, changing market conditions, which I think is, you know, part of the beauty of working in this program. Awesome. So construction is an area that we touched on a little bit. Maureen, construction is an area we have seen needing more innovation for a long time. Do you see any parts of construction in either residential or commercial building programs that could benefit more from focusing on engaging with the startup sector? The startup sector, I think, offers um, the construction industry endless possibilities. We hope through this program and hopefully more to come that we will get the construction industry more and more interested in engaging with startups so that we can help leverage these, these startups. Look, it's about efficiency and coordination and it's very much about information. So if you can use technology to present information differently, real-time information that improves the efficiency and the coordination in construction, that's where the bonuses will be in engaging with startups. Uh, I also think, you know, that the technology around um, virtual reality, holograms, engaging in that space, you know, we, again, we we should be able to improve construction and I think improve problem solving. One of the big areas in our um, industry is infrastructure coordination. Uh, so if we have platforms where we can see what's happening with the infrastructure, engage with the con constructors, 
um, and the consultants and others more readily with real-time information, I think the industry would benefit enormously. The other thing is I think it um, construction's fairly traditional um, and the startup community, I hope, would energise the industry and attract younger people and a lot of tech-savvy people into the industry. And that in itself will infect the industry. Um, and it's hard to move some of these industries that have been around for a long time doing things the same way. Well, we can't continue to do things the same way. We have to be prepared to fail and experiment, but, but be prepared to do things differently. Liz, you talked about the opportunities of smart cities. Do you think the government and the private sector are tapping into startups enough? And if not, how can the PropTech sector in Australia demonstrate their value and break into major development opportunities such as the Western Sydney Airport and the Aerotropolis? Um, look, I think there's always room to do more. Uh, I think definitely government has some good programs in place. So on the major infrastructure projects like the airport, which is just really life changing for Western Sydney, the metro's just been announced uh, through to St Mary's from the airport. On top of that, many other infrastructure projects going on, um, including the Aerotropolis. You can already feel an ecosystem developing of, you know, advanced technologies, open data sets, um, the need to gather data, think about communities. So what I would say is I think um, there are programs underway, certainly through the city deal, there is a very strong commitment to the Western Parkland city being that digital enabled and smart city. And already there's been a big program through Simon Hunter's group um, in government. So I would really encourage the startups and small companies to tap into some of the government initiatives that are underway around that. So so it, there's certainly the appetite. Similarly, I would encourage uh, engagement with local government because local government really has um, a great need for really advanced technologies, smart ideas to improve their systems and their, uh, their work. And so there's definitely that appetite to be looking more local and to um, local businesses. In relation to the private sector, I think, you know, Maureen and and uh, Jamie have touched on that. I think most definitely anything that adds value to what, let's face it, is a complex system. It is a complex system planning, construction, property, and there's an appetite from the, you know, the community for that sustainability, zero carbon, how are we going to be, live sustainably? I think any company that can embrace those sort of meta themes and show how they're adding value to a private large company will you know, to Jamie's point, do be very well received. So, yeah, it's an exciting opportunity at the moment. Yep. So, Jamie, how can startups best demonstrate value for enterprise customers? Um, thanks, Beck. Look, one of the things we've really emphasised in this program is understanding your customer and creating a really strong value proposition. And I think. You know, from my perspective, that's the essence of a really good startup. One of the advantages, I think, of this particular cohort is that most of the founders, if not all of them, come from some background in the industry. And so they're scratching an itch that they've seen, uh, you know, or a problem they've seen as part of their previous experience. And, and so for me, that creates a really, really strong customer centricity. Um, in a particular value proposition. And so, you know, I think to answer your question, it's, it's very much around orientating everything you do about solving a very specific, you know, customer problem. It's not really about technology and a lot of, you know, the startups in this uh, cohort are, you know, very flashy in terms of they've got, you know, great visualization or they've got some really good technology, but most of them orientated around solving a really strong and relevant customer problem. And I think that's the essence of all good startups, to be honest. So Maureen, how is Lancome demonstrating leadership in the property industry? Lancome's got a history of innovation really and showing leadership. Um, we at the moment are engaging on a um, range of demonstration projects designed to lead um, the industry in terms of affordable housing. So some of those include repurposing of existing buildings, um, rethinking the urban design components to get a higher yield, um, a different product, and to really transform some of the streetscape so that in these communities um, people can enjoy the street. And that, that includes a lot, a lot of different changes to the way we look at landscaping and so on. 
Um, and obviously, as we go forward with the technology around solar and water reuse, um, permeable pavements, permeable surfaces, I think we can make these demonstration projects um, highlight new initiatives in terms of sustainability, particularly with water and um, energy. Thanks, Maureen. Finally, Liz, how can we best build a thriving ecosystem for prop tech startups in Western Sydney? Yeah, well, it, it's a great time to do that. I think um, if we look at the development of Sydney and, and really our focus on Sydney as three great cities, you know, you look at Parramatta and the central city and the development and the companies that are there now, um, and already you can feel the opportunity for a great ecosystem there of universities, TAFE, uh, big companies uh, to collaborate to support the startup ecosystem there. But beyond there, certainly as you go further west into the Parkland City, um, it really is an environment where you've got eight councils working together, you've got strong uh, state and federal collaboration and focus, and you've got major infrastructure, you've got green fields, you've got brown fields. I honestly can't think of a better place to use as a, a launch pad or a, um, to build an ecosystem of collaboration mm -hmm. for the startup community. I'm, I'm a big advocate and uh, fan for it, and I think if we're genuine about our creating an innovation corridor in the West, we, we, have, we have to push this and property is a great uh, place to, to start. Already we're well underway on health and ed, on some of the major sectors that are coming. You would have seen the CSIRO announcement relocating to the Aerotropolis. So it's an area that is ripe for this opportunity and you will certainly find universities, TAFE, community members, local councils, state government and, and others, you know, ready and willing to participate in those ecosystems which build that, that collaborative effort and no doubt the private sector. So it's a great, it's a great environment to be in. Yeah. Amazing. Thank you so much panel members for your generous time and insights today. Fantastic. Thank Thanks, you. Thanks, Thanks Thank Beck. You. Thanks to Launchpad and, mm. and everyone. Thank you for tuning in to the 2020 Urban Futures Demo Day. Following this event, you will receive a brochure with all the startup and speaker bios. The startup pitch decks will also be made available for download. If you have expressed interest in speaking with the startups during the event, they will be in touch shortly. We want to congratulate the startups who pitched today and thank all the partners who've been involved in this program and demo day. We hope you enjoyed this event. If you'd like to get involved in future programs as a partner, mentor, investor, startup, or just want to learn more, please visit us at launchpadlive.com.au forward slash urban futures.